It's interesting the things you can see on video sped up that you can't see otherwise. Like a pressure vessel inflating like a balloon. That's slightly alarming. Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondiax. Did you know that tennis balls wear out? If you're not a tennis player, you might not have known that. But they're pressurized when they're new and over time they lose their pressure and they're not so bouncy anymore. The question is, can we bring new life back to old tennis balls? Let's find out. This is a corny keg, slang for Cornelius keg. It's a staple of the home brewing hobby. And this is something that other folks on YouTube have demonstrated that you can use to repressurize old tennis balls. And so I wanna test that theory and see if it works. A friend of mine has this keg and wants to use it for both this purpose and a few other sciencey things. So we're gonna make some modifications to it for those purposes. The reason that tennis balls go flat is that the skin of them is ever so slightly porous. And so as they get bounced around a lot, the pressure inside can find its way outside the ball. So the idea is you use that same property to repressurize them by putting them in a pressurized container for a long period of time and forcing pressurized air back into them through the skin. This keg has two fittings that we can interface with. This is called a ball lock fitting. It's common in home brewing and I presume other food service areas. And we need to interface with this because my friend wants a pressure gauge on this keg. Now the other post is used for filling it and this is a Schrader valve adapter that you can buy for these kegs. So it interfaces that fitting to a standard bicycle or tire filling pump. On this other fitting, my friend wants to install a pressure gauge. So I need to find some way to attach that there. So of course I went straight to the obvious approach just to secure that like so. Looks good, all right. Great job everyone, video over. I'll see you all next week. I'm just kidding. I've got this piece of hex bar stock with which I want to attach that pressure gauge. So of course I'll just secure that, the obvious one. All right, I had to make it one more time. I promise that's the last time I'll make that joke. In case you're wondering why the ports are marked in and out, it's just because one of them has a siphon tube attached to it, and that's only relevant for the actual brewing purpose of this keg. For what we're using it for, it doesn't matter. They're both just ports into the pressure vessel. Now to figure out what that thread is. So get out the old trusty thread pitch gauge here and it appears to be 18 threads per inch. I tried various imperial and metric and that is the only one that fit. But on the major diameter of the threads, now things get weird. We're looking at 587 thou, which is not any kind of standard imperial thread, but it is within thread tolerance of an M15 metric thread. However, that thread pitch converted to metric 18 threads per inch would be close to 1.4 millimeter. So maybe this is an M15 by 1.4 metric thread. It's not a common or standard metric thread, but you know, it does exist. So that seemed to be the most likely candidate. I'm gonna to need to cut an internal thread and it's gonna be difficult to test fit because the male thread is attached to the keg. So I'm gonna start by making myself a little go no-go gauge here. I grabbed this piece of steel scrap, which longtime viewers will recognize from my turning saw video. I'll start by facing the end as is tradition. And I'm gonna make a little go no-go gauge here, basically the male thread that I think is what is on that keg. And that will allow me to verify some assumptions. And since I'm lucky enough to have both a male and a female thread of what I'm trying to create, I can use this to verify that the thread is what I think it is. So I turned that down to 15 millimeter. Then I put a generous chamfer on the end just to make it nice. And I'm also gonna put a groove at the base of this thread with a round nosed tool to give us a little starting groove there for the thread cutting tool and also cause it looks nice. Then I set up my threading gears to a metric pitch of 1.4 millimeter. As I said, definitely not a common metric pitch, but it does exist. My threading gears have that setting on them. So I went ahead and did my scratch pass and verified it. Now I don't actually have a 1.4 millimeter metric thread pitch gauge. So I'm using 18 there to check it. 18 threads per inch imperial is extremely close to 1.4 millimeter. So I went ahead and cut this thread. I'm using the method where you keep the half nut engaged because it's a metric thread being cut with an imperial lead screw. So you just power in both directions without ever disengaging the half nut. And when powering towards the chuck, of course, that's a little terrifying. So you stop short and then wind it in to your starting groove by hand. And of course I'm threading inside out with the threading tool upside down as is my preferred method. For 
Once I got the thread to the correct dimensions, I went ahead and did a test fit with that fitting, and it threads halfway on and then gets stuck. Now, you might think, well, I just have a tight spot in the middle there. I just need to take another spring pass, something like that. However, that's not actually what's happening. I did another cut now with an 18 threads per inch imperial setting on my change gears and the same diameter, and that threads on perfectly. Now, let's take a look at what's happening here because this is actually really interesting. This is the M15 by 1.4 thread. You can see that the fitting threads on halfway and gets stuck. And here's the second test part I cut. This is 18 threads per inch, major diameter of 590 thou, and it threads on perfectly. So the second one is the correct one. If I line up the two threads, you can see they're ever so slightly different. That 1.4 millimeter thread pitch while it's basically correct, as the thread gets deeper, the error accumulates to the point where it's no longer compatible. So at the start of the thread, you're basically within the tolerance fit on the thread. But as the fitting threads on deeper, that tolerance gets used up and the error accumulates and it gets stuck. Super interesting and it's why precision matters in thread cutting, especially on longer threads. But okay, so 590 thou, that would make this thread something like 1930 seconds 18 like that's that's not a real thread what is this thing so then i did some research and yep 1930 seconds 18 is what's known as a keg post thread in the food and beverage industry and it's nonsense my best guess on this is that this is some kind of mechanical drm like they intentionally use a thread that you can't buy fittings for so that you have to use their fittings or possibly as a safety thing to keep you from attaching things that you shouldn't attach to a pressure vessel willy-nilly or maybe this is common in that space i don't know the most surefire way to know you've stumbled blindly into a brand new vertical is encountering a crazy thread you've never seen before but now that we know what it is, I can make this adapter for the pressure gauge with confidence. So I'll figure out how long my hex bar stock needs to be here, give or take. It's not too important here as long as I have enough space on both ends for each thread. I'll cut this to length with my trusty portaband. Side note, a lot of folks have told me, hey, you need a table for that portaband so you can cut straight. And yes, I know, I would love to get one. And in fact, a viewer actually donated funds for the purpose, which are sitting waiting for the day when I have enough shop space to have such a table set up. I do not have the bench space for it right now. Into the lathe now, and I'll start by facing off the end as is tradition. Next I'll move on to the through hole, so I'm going to punch a number two center in there, and then I'm going to run a pilot drill all the way through the piece. This is of course a plumbing fitting at the end of the day, so it needs to be a pipe. I'll follow that pilot drill up with the tap drill size for one quarter NPT, which is a tapered pipe thread, which is what's on the pressure gauge. So that's what's going to be on the far side of this fitting. So I'm going to go all the way through with it now because it's smaller than what I need on the fitting that goes on this side, which is the keg. Just an easy way to get ahead a couple of steps here. Now this end I need to open up to effectively the tap drill size for that weird thread that I'm going to make. So I'm going to mark a length here on the largest drill that I have that is smaller than the minor diameter of the internal thread, 19 30 seconds 18. Now that thread doesn't even exist in Machinery's Handbook, but you can do the math from the thread equations in there to figure out what the minor diameter should be. Now in my case, luckily, I actually have a female fitting that fits on there, so I just measured that. After the drill, I went in with the boring bar to bring it to the final dimension, because of course it's a weird dimension that I don't have a drill for, being a weird thread. And then a little deeper, and we are ready to go. Double check that dimension, and we should be ready to do the internal threading of this part. Now, of course, as far as I know, you can't buy a 19 30 seconds 18 tap, so I'm going to single point cut this thread. I don't have an internal threading tool small enough for this job, so I've got a carbide split blank here, and I'm going to grind the tool to do the job. Carbide split blanks are great. They're just a precision piece of carbide round bar that's been ground exactly in half at one end, and that saves you a lot of time when grinding your own tools. I marked the clearance depth that I need and I traced the profile of my tool in layout fluid there and I'm roughing it in on the bench grinder. 
Bench grinder is a very brute force tool for grinding something this small, but gets us in the ballpark in a hurry. And now I can refine this over on the D-bit grinder. I'm using a 400 grit diamond cup wheel there. The material removal rate is very slow here, but it's easy to control and leaves an excellent finish. With good light and magnification, I can grind very precisely right up to my layout lines and double checking with the fishtail gauge as I go. I also ground an offhand version of this just in case. Speaking of the fishtail gauge, I now use that to square up the tool to the work. I'm using the faced front of the hex bar stock and I've got the tool sideways because it won't fit the other way. And I'm just using one edge of the tool there. You can verify that the angle of the compound is correct while we're here as well, simply by moving it and verifying that the angle of the tool moves exactly along that edge of the fishtail gauge. Onto the single point internal thread cutting now. I've done a video on this recently if you'd like to see this process in more detail and all the reasons that I'm doing what I'm doing, but I'm gonna just go ahead and cut it here. I didn't bother doing a scratch pass and checking it and all that because I'd already set the threading gears in the lathe for when I made the go no go gauge for this job. I just left them in there throughout all the rest of these operations, which is why the lathe sounds like a cat being strangled in a wine press. So I did my passes until I was right about where the math says my depth on that thread should be, which is easy to determine because even though it's a weird thread, the thread pitch is very normal. It's just 18 threads per inch. The thread pitch tells you how deep the thread should be. And that seems to be an excellent fit on my go-no-go -no -go gauge. Very happy with that. Very little play in that. Really, really good fit there. All right, a little deburring, make this look nice. And while I'm here, I'm actually gonna throw the chamfering tool in there as well and knock those corners off. Anytime you face hex bar stock, you end up with very, very sharp corners. And uh, so chamfering them is always a nice idea. And it also looks nice. Makes it look like a proper fitting if it's chamfered. Now I can flip it over and do the other end. But before I do that, since I've got it out of the lathe anyway, I'll take it over to the keg and just do a little test fit on there. And sure enough, that fits beautifully. I see you corny keg company putting weird threads on your things so I gotta buy your fittings. To that I say, ha, I've got a lathe and I kinda know how to use it. Now I'll prep the other end of this fitting. So I'm gonna clean out the tailstock and get my spring-loaded tap follower in there. Some of you may not have seen these before. If you haven't, basically it's just a spring-loaded pointy thing that centers in the back of a tap wrench or in the back of some larger taps and allows you to hold the tap wrench centered while you turn it and also springs in and out so you can crank the tap in and back it out as you go. But in this case, I'm gonna use the center in the tap itself because it's a large tap and I'm just gonna turn it with a wrench. I'll get some lubricant on there and away we go. Now the pressure gauge at least is a standard. It's one quarter NPT, national pipe taper. And the great thing about standards is how many of them there are. I've yet to figure out what the secret sauce is for knowing how deep to go with tapered pipe thread taps. So I just trial fit them until it seems to fit. And there we go. Looks like that gauge will go in far enough to seal there. Tapered pipe threads do seal very well, but I am not a big fan of them. They're a pain in the patootie. I would much rather just put Loctite 545 on straight threads. But you know, your mileage may vary. And then once again, I'll taper the other end of this to make it look all snazzy. And well, hey, as long as we're buying a ticket on the snazzy train, let's go to the final stop. And I'm gonna buff this up on the scotch Bright wheel. It's gonna look very, very nice for about two weeks. I'm ready for pressure testing of this whole setup now. So I'll thread my shiny new fitting on there and I'll thread the pressure gauge on there. And what I wanna do is seal this thing up and pressurize it and make sure that it's gonna hold pressure. The modus operandi of this tennis ball rejuvenation idea is that you have to hold the tennis balls in this pressure vessel for two weeks at a certain pressure. So it needs to hold about 32 PSI for this. So I pumped it up with my little tire compressor and it's definitely bleeding down. So I did some checking and it turns out it was that plastic Schrader valve adapter that was leaking. So I removed that and the basic ball post fitting actually seals extremely well. There's no sign of leaks there. Before I actually put the balls in there, let's do some science. So I've marked three of them, black, red, and blue. And I'll put a tape up here, make sure it's plumb. I know that doesn't look plumb, but the workbench isn't plumb and neither is the camera. So trust me that the tape measure is plumb and I'll drop each of the balls and see where they land. I did three iterations of each and the blue ball bounced to 
11.5 and 12. Now the tape measure should have been the other way around, so smaller numbers are better here. I'm an idiot, I'm sorry. But the units don't matter. We're just trying to measure if this pressurization improves their bounciness. The black ball bounced to 12, 11, and 11. The red ball bounced to 14 each time. So the red one is apparently the flattest one, and very consistently so. For final assembly, I am putting Loctite 545 on everything. It does seem to hold pressure, but I want to be sure because this thing needs to hold pressure for two full weeks. So there's my three marked balls going in there. And I'm fully expecting to need to top up the pressure a little bit along the way. So I was planning to check it each day and top it up if needed. Using the Schrader valve adapter once again, put my compressor on there and I inflated it to 32 PSI, which is what the internet says to use for rejuvenating tennis balls. I set that aside for two weeks and while we wait, have you ever wondered what's inside a tennis ball? Let's find out. Let's cut one apart and see how they're made. I've got an old one here that is in pretty bad shape, so we'll dismember it for science. A little utility knife action there and we can crack it open like the skulls of our enemies and as you can see what it actually is is just basically a racket ball wrapped in genuine organic muppet skin so you can see how there's no way for the air to get out except through the rubber itself which is ever so slightly porous at a microscopic level and that's hopefully what we can leverage to repressurize them and they really don't bounce after you do that to them Two weeks have elapsed, and I was pleasantly surprised at how little pressure this thing lost. It only lost 2 PSI in two weeks. The bleed down was so slow that I never refilled it because every day I was checking it and it didn't seem to have dropped at all. So I never refilled it at all. I just sat there for two weeks with 32 PSI in it. So using the relief valve there, I bled the pressure back down. I gotta say, these little kegs are pretty impressive for how well they hold pressure. It appears to be stamped entirely from a single sheet of stainless. There's no seams in it anywhere. And it's got a pressure lid that's uh, the same design, actually, as they used to use for the service ports on steam boilers with a gasket on the inside like that. And let's get inside this thing, and it's the moment of truth. Let's see if our tennis balls are bouncy once again. On casual inspection, some of the balls definitely seem firmer. Some of them are definitely not. Some of them are still mush, but some of them seem much firmer now. Actually, possibly too firm. But the truth will be in the science. So I'll do the drop test again. First with the blue. This time we get 13, 12, and 12. The black went 12, 12, and 12. And the red went 13, 13, and 12. So what's the verdict? Well, I think we have to say it didn't really work. Two of them seemed to get slightly worse. One of them got slightly better, but not appreciably so. So I think that although I've seen this method work on other people's YouTube channels, it's definitely not a sure thing. It might be that the balls I'm using are too old to, uh, to save, or maybe I needed to use higher pressure or put them in there longer. Not sure. Anyway, it was a fun exercise. I hope you enjoyed watching me go through it. Thank you very much for watching. If you can swing it, I know not everybody can, and that's okay, but support me there on Patreon. And until next time, thanks for watching.